and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. But some of you may know him as the Awesome Soul, some as some as Mitch, the developer of Tamers, which we will be talking about tonight. The one and only Mitch Turnbull. How you doing today, man? Or tonight, Pretty good. Yes. Well, yeah, either way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Thanks for having me. So, one of the big traditions around here is opening with the humble beginnings, in a sense. With that, oh. sa with that said, I'd like you. I'd like you to walk me through what. Um, what was your introduction to role playing games, and what made it stick? Uh, yeah, what was I dark? And no, I'm just kidding. Um, it was honestly, uh, as I'm sure, a lot of people have kind of gotten into it this way. Uh, it would be D and D, specifically Five E. Um. Initially, it started with just stumbling across videos and um, like from YouTubers and whatnot, and finding it pretty interesting, but never really getting the courage to run it for myself. Uh, eventually, my fiance one day was just like, "Hey, do you want to go pick up the the starter set for D and D?" And I was like, "Sure, why not?" And from there, well, it brought me to this point and what you're watching right now, I suppose. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, after that, it um, I definitely got quite into it. It kind of overtook me a little bit. It became my, my uh, main focus. And one thing I kind of noticed was there was a lot of class fantasies that weren't really covered. So I took it upon myself to kind of start fleshing that out. Um, so previous to starting Tamers, I was a uh, class designer over on the DMs Guild. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I've got like six of them under my belt so far. Uh, potentially more in the future, but Tamers is really eating that up right now. Yeah. And... As I understand now, as I understand it, this is something that is drawing upon both Pokemon and Monster Hunter, which is a interesting combination. Mm -hmm. What what did what made you want to draw bet between those two specifically? And I and as a follow up, um, what jet what gen of Pokemon in in well general are you are you drawing upon? Um. <clears throat> It's it's not necessarily a specific um, generation of Pokemon, but more so just, like, the general feel of it. Um, uh, basically just kind of, like, typical, more of, like, a JRPG style rather than just, like, your typical um, epic fantasy. Uh, as far as... Or, well, that's what uh, the whole Pokemon aspect. As well as, you know, you're fighting with a creature, but also you've got your main character. Um, and then Monster Hunter. Monster Hunter, uh, more so for uh, a very specific kind of boss fight we have in the game. Um, the, uh, the default setting, um, and I suppose kind of like any other setting you want, would have like rules for how to kind of set up this archetype. Um, but it's basically just like you have a monster and then you as the DM can kind of use these rules to customize it to make it this big hulking behemoth of a creature mm. who is like infected with these magical parasites. Uh, it's known as a rot host uh, because the spell rot are these little parasitic creatures born from like an elemental calamity. And they've infested the creature and can mutate it into various forms. So, uh, in the playtest I was just running a little while ago, 
um, let's just say the the players run into this monster, and then all of a sudden wings sprout from its back, but they're like goopy and sort of parasitic. People, they're going to be like, oh, that's a spell rot. We need to target that specific piece. And then as the fight goes on, it uses new abilities granted to it by these parasites. And at that point, the players can either continue to target the main body or target the individual pieces to stop them from using those abilities. Like if, it, if they're having a lot of trouble and their party is mainly up-close brawlers, if this thing is flying, they're probably going to want to take those wings out quickly. Yeah. Um, and I suppose another bit of Monster Hunter inspiration is that in this game, you it's not just like a typical Pokemon game where you stand on the sidelines and point and shout, and like, hey, creature, do this for me, while you just sit there twiddling your thumbs. Your character and monster share the same turn, and your character, which is the, you know, the tamer, right? Uh, you can equip them with weapons and items and whatnot to actually go into the fray and fight as well. Given that, have has anyone brought up um, Shin Megami Tensei to you, given the whole you're fighting alongside the monsters approach? Um, I think somebody brought it up, but now that you mention it, yeah, that is, uh, that is definitely... Um, well... Not intended, but uh, it definitely works as an analogy. Mm -hmm. Considered a case of accidental genius. I suppose so. <laughs> yep. Now, with that, with that in mind, what I, one of the things I did notice is that, unless I'm mistaken, you have two primary means of resolution. One of them is a D, is a success based D six approach, which is what you're using for skills, and Correct. on the other hand, a D twenty based affair when it comes to combat. Mm hmm. Um, yeah, I kind of just went. What prompted oh, the sorry. D six approach? Um, <clears throat> I was just kind of experimenting with a few things and uh, showed it off to a few people that uh, I normally run D&D for. They're my playtesting group. Uh, and they honestly seem to really enjoy it more than the typical just roll a d20 and you either pass or fail. The way, cause the way things work in Tamers is your proficiency determines how many d6s you roll. And the DM will give a, uh, a skill roll uh, requirement. So let's just say uh, there's a sleeping guard and just one of them, and you're trying to sneak past. This would be an SR2, which is the lowest it can go. It's a pretty easy situation. So the guy who's really proficient with stealth, let's just say he's like uh, proficiency four. He's rolling four of the D6s. Um, chances are something really good is going to happen. Because it's a sliding scale. You've got a fail, which is no successes. Uh, one is you succeed, but something bad happens. Uh, two is you succeed as you intended. And three successes is you uh, succeed and like go above and beyond. So in this little situation here where we've got the sleeping guard, let's just say a person only gets one success. They wander off to the other side, but... Perhaps once they reach the door, they stumble over a rock or something. They're fine. They made it un, uh, unnoticed. But now the guard wakes up. And now everyone else has to deal with this uh, woken up guard. Maybe they don't necessarily see the party, but they're going to need to find another way around. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, is a lot more interesting um, and kind of leads to a few more roleplay moments um, than just like you either succeed or you don't. Right? Mm -hmm. So a bit of but and. Yeah, basically. So with that, with that in mind, um, I, think, I think that's as good of a spot as any to talk about how 
you how you have the core stats set up in a in a way that upgrading them is not is not just a one to one, but actually has a um, actually has a bit a bit of a cascade that you're choosing instead of just a, instead of just providing a modifier. Yeah, so it's a it's a lot more of a customizable kind of uh, setup I'm going for. And if I'm not mistaken, it's a case where um, the differing effect is based on is based on what you choose every even and odd number for each stat, for each of the core stats, or as as it's referred to in the book, aspects. Yeah, correct. Um, so we've got your. It's basically the stats are basically split up into uh, primary aspects and potential stats. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is. Let's just say. Um, well, I'll, I'll list them all off. I suppose you've got. Uh, it's a seven stat system. You've got. Um, I guess an easy way to break it down would be your body stats are constitution and agility. Your power stats are might, will, and mind. To go with uh, sort of the Pokemon analogy, might is physical attack, mm -hmm. and will is special attack. Mind is sort of, doesn't really appear in any kind of Pokemon game, but it's more so, what if status moves from Pokemon had their own stat? Is kind of what I was going for with that. Although it, it does more Instead things. Instead of being it's, lumped into special attack? Yeah, basically. Uh, and then your defenses, you've got grit and spirit. Mm -hmm. Which is so, why you gave the shield symbol for for those. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, <clears throat> so, this is... Um, uh, so each stat can range from 1 to 30. Mm -hmm. And let's just uh, hone in on agility as an example here. So you've got agility, and you want to bump it up. For every odd number of investment, which also includes uh, base stats as well, you're going to increase a primary aspect. For agility, that primary aspect is your movement speed. So it's how many hexes you can move across the battlefield in one turn. Mm -hmm. uh, for every even number, so two, four, six, you know, so on and so forth, you get a potential stat choice. For agility, that is either accuracy or dodge. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing that's the reason why there's the pips under each on the character sheet. Correct, yeah. Uh, that, uh, for anybody sort of following along, um, I assume you'll probably have like links to download and whatnot in the description. Um, the plan that I had was to link the beacons because I, I grabbed the thing from your Discord server. Gotcha. That works too. Alright, yeah, it would be on the Discord server. Um, but yeah, uh, that sort of uh, character sheet is still a bit of a work in progress. The, the layout is more or less how I like it, but uh, I'm going to be working with my artist eventually to kind of spruce that up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when it can, now with that with that in mind uh, I, there's a few there's a few other things I did want I did want to go into when I looked at the when I looked at the sample characters that you had that you had for both tam for both tamers and monsters I'd want to start with the tamers end of things mm -hmm. there seemed to be the vibe that th that for tamers there is something of a soft class system it seems to be built on, if I'm not, if I'm understanding this right, based based on talents. Is it a case mm -hmm. where you're pick you're picking talents every few levels along a path? How are you having it work out? Yeah. Uh, so in this current playtest, there aren't character creation rules, um, but that will eventually be in uh, later playtests. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> to give an example of how the talent system is going to work, um, it is, like you said, it's kind of a soft class system, um, but it's more so done in a tiered system. Mm -hmm. 
So the way I have it now, uh, this game is a level 1 to 30 system, kind of mirroring how the stats are also 1 to 30. Mm-hmm. Um, every three levels, uh, and also level 1 as well, you get, do get to pick um, from a talent option. So let's just say you pick the warrior um, option. You'll see a list of... Um, right now I'm kind of aiming for 8, but that might change. Uh, 8 tier 1 talents. And once you have 3 tier 1 talents, you can then start picking tier 2 talents. You get 3 of those, then you can start picking uh, tier 3 um, and that's the, the highest it goes. Mm-hmm. So if a player wanted to, they could be like, okay, I've gotten kind of what I want out of the warrior uh, talent group. Now I kind of want to go into rogue. So then they take a rogue talent, and then three, and then they go to tier two, and what have you. Mm-hmm. Um because it's a 30 level system, you're going to be gaining levels relatively quickly. Uh, so the ability to kind of go with either just one or two uh, different talents and kind of like switch back and forth as you level up uh, is definitely a lot more of a thing you can do in this system. The way you describe it, it also sounds like multiclassing won't be as surmountable of of an affair as it is in some fantasy games. No. That my my goal is to make it as seamless as possible. Mhm. Mhm. Cuz in my experience you've had cases where either a the requirements to multi-class require uh, are require you to build around, around it very early on or yeah. b you have ca- you have cases where your pay- where um you're spending long amounts of time sucking so that you can get the class fantasy that you want. Or yeah. C, or C, you treat certain archetypes as what's been what's nicknamed dip classes. Mm. Yep. Which is a fancy way of say, of saying you take you go in there for a few levels to get a a certain thing and then you never touch that class again. Yeah, exactly. It's another thing I'm trying to avoid. Because mm-hmm. um, in the way I have it now, and I think I probably will stick with this uh, method, is there are repeating talent options. So in uh, the Bard and the Rogue, uh, for example, a Tier 2 uh, talent option they both share is um, uh, skill proficiency. So they, they're just better at doing skills, for example. Um, and there's going to be a few others in there, so if you really want to have a character that's good with skills, uh, going back to that example, um, you can go into Bard, or Rogue, or any of the other ones that are there. Um, let's just say you want to go and get a few from Rogue, but you mainly want to be Bard, well, you still would be able to get that Tier 2 um, talent option feature instead of going super deep into Bard. Mm-hmm. Uh, to Rogue, rather. Uh, another thing that kind of trying to solve um, is basically core features of a talent group kind of level up as you progress through them. So you'll get um... Like, uh, the Rogue, for example, is basically good at getting more crits. And that's just kind of what you can get from Tier 1. Which is like, cool, if you dip, you can get more crit, and then you can go to the other one. But if you progress into Rogue, to like the Tier 2s and Tier 3 talent options, you're going to start finding things where uh, you can crit more often still. But, if you do crit, it's more powerful. And there's other things where it's like, if you crit, you can then drop a stat from uh, your target. Mm -hmm. Uh, But those are only available in the Tier 2 thing. So it's not really front-loaded. So that's going to be, hopefully, uh, if it all works out, uh, hopefully kind of solving the issue of just like 
dipping and then going back to your uh, main class, and now you have a super powerful combo. Yeah. Now I know you. Dem I know you've presented the bard, rogue, and warrior um, ta um, talent trees. I guess, I guess I'll say since they're not necessarily classes. Mm -hmm. But what are some of the other classes that you would, so, sorry, not cl not classes, ta um, talent groupings in this sense, that you would end up having? Yeah, um, so I will just quickly pull up the list here. So my goal uh, right now uh, is, I believe 13 is what I'm kind of aiming for, uh, that might change but that's the goal for now um so like i said we've got the warrior um hold on there we go found the list okay uh so the quick little breakdown of what i have here is i've got the alchemist uh which is going to be sort of focusing on potions and medicine uh, and there, there is, in this game, going to be a crafting system. So you'll see that some of these classes are more so crafting, and, like, they'll be good in combat, but they're going to have skills out of combat. So after you've uh, raided an old mine, for example, um, and you find a lot of iron, uh, if you were the smith talent option, or the talent group, you could find ways of making new armor and what have you. Uh, so, Alchemist is going to be good at brewing potions out of things you find in the wilderness. Uh, Bard is all about sort of inspiring your allies. Uh, the Beastmaster uh, is going to be all about monster synergies. So, your character is going to be taking a bit more of a backseat, uh, and the monster just kind of like goes to town. Uh, kind of touching on what I alluded to earlier in the whole um, different talent groups are going to have similar or the same um, talent options repeating. A lot of classes will, or uh, talent groups, sorry, uh, will have ways of interacting with your monster. So don't worry, it's not just like if you want to interact with your monster, you have to go Beastmaster. Mm. It's just... Beastmaster was kind of my way of lumping all of those beast-related things from all of the other talent groups into one talent group itself. Uh, if So if players wanted to just focus on the monster, that is the way to go. Yeah. Uh, we've got Ch Ch Channeler, mm -hmm. which is... Uh, so... There are, like I said earlier, there's Might, Will, and Mind... Uh, that is mirrored by different techniques, so think of those as your Pokemon moves. Channeler lets you learn Might. Uh, Mage lets you learn Will. And Scholar lets you learn Mind. Uh, they do some other things as well. But uh, we've also got Culinarian if you want food. Mm. Elementalist if you want uh, to expand upon the elemental quirk system you get at uh, character creation. Uh, to touch on that real quick, um, uh, as you're making your character, basically you pick an element, say you want to be the rubber element, for example. You'd get a bunch of other options, like um, uh, leap, for example, gives you the, the uh, leap traversal power, which lets you jump farther, uh, stretch, you can stretch your arms, uh, things like that. So the elemental list is all about tapping into uh, your element, and... Uh, making it more powerful. Inventor is gear and equipment, another crafting class. Rogue, pretty self-explanatory, we've gone over that already. Sharpshooter for long-range combat, and warrior for melee combat. Mm -hmm. and, and there we go. Yeah, I can I can certainly get that. When you mention um, elemental alignment, I'm getting... I know a lot of people will ass will assume the standard elements, but since you mentioned rubber as an element, I'm guessing that there are some elemental combinations that are going to be a bit more unorthodox than others. Uh, somewhat. 
Uh, rubber is kind of the most unorthodox out there. Uh, Tamer is, is a uh, 17 elemental system. Uh, so neutral, uh, which in this system, if you're used to Pokemon, neutral is a bit different in this system. It's not just like the normal type. It's more so the devoid type. Uh, in the sort of the, the little elemental sort of lore backstory kind of thing I've got, um, uh, for the main setting rather anyway, um, TLDR, big calamity happened thousands of years ago where this magical nuke essentially went off and irradiated the land with all of this elemental energy. Neutral used to be something else. Its power faded away, and now it's kind of this weird, hollowed-out element that can kind of disrupt other elements. It's going to have a lot of attacks like that. Um, it's got Brawler, Magic... Uh, which is more, think of it like, um, just like all, it's basically all of the weird, wacky, wild stuff that couldn't really be done with the other elements. It's sort of gone into their, like, teleportation and whatnot. Spirit, if you want ghosts, and the afterlife. Fire, pretty self-explanatory. Water, nature, earth, wind, frost, lightning. Those are all pretty, what they say on the tin. Um, sound. Uh, metal, rubber, poison, light, and dark. Yeah. And I think I think what would be in I think would be an in, what would be an interesting little experiment to do is I'm going to list off the the types in Pokemon, and I'd like you to tell me which ones would be a rough equivalent, or if it's something that's better represented in things outside of elements. Yeah, fair enough. All right. I'm skipping normal because you kind of are you kind of already addressed that. Yeah. And an equivalent for normal would be tricky because normal is meant to be the jack normal types are meant to be a jack of many trades approach. Mhm. Mm well, except for that fucking mill tank back in gen back in gen 2, you know the one. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um fire Fire is fire, for sure. Water. Uh, water is water. It's in there. Electric. Uh, lightning. Grass. Uh, nature would be the best fit there. Ice. Frost, for sure. Fighting. Brawler. Poison. Uh, poison. Ground. Uh, that would be lumped in with earth. Flying. Uh, wind is probably your best equivalent there. Uh, wind is more of just like the elemental thing, whereas flying in um, Pokemon eventually started, or initially started as the bird type, which is why you see so many birds are just like, yeah, it's flying. Mm -hmm. But I suppose that's the best equivalent there. Yep. Psychic. Uh, there isn't necessarily a direct link, but I suppose magic would probably be your best bet. Well, hopefully it doesn't break the game like Psychic did in the early gens. <laughs> uh, so far, we haven't had any issues in the playtest with magic. <laughs> so. Bug. Uh, bug would probably best be lumped into nature, though I don't necessarily have a bug equivalent. Which is kind of ironic, because Bug is my favorite Pokemon type. Well, the sole reason the, the, sole reason the franchise even started was Satoshi being a bug, co being a bug collector. <laughs> yeah. Uh, rock. Uh, rock would also be lumped in with Earth. Ghost. That would be Spirit. Dragon. Uh, Dragon definitely does not have an equivalent in this system. All right. I suppose magic, if you really want to be, if you're really looking for one, but not really. Like, there's no, like, there's lots of dragon-like creatures in this system, but they're of varying types. Is fair. 
dark? Uh, dark would be... If... Funnily enough, the dark element is not necessarily the best fit for the dark type in Pokemon. Uh, in Pokemon, it's basically the evil type. In Tamers, dark is more so focused on illusions and trickery. Mm -hmm. Steel. Uh, would be metal. All right. Fairy. Uh, fairy does not have an equivalent in this system, but magic again, I suppose, if you're looking for one. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, there's the infamous chart that ra that ranges between no effect, not very effective, normal, and super effective. I'm guessing with your with the way you have elemental strengths and weaknesses set up, it's going to be a bit more simplified. Uh, somewhat. Uh, we do have the the full-on list of interactions, but there will be spots on character sheets where you can easily sort of take a look and be like, oh, yeah, that's what I'm weak to, or that's what I'm resistant to, or what have you. Uh, same thing with uh, enemy um, stat blocks that the DM's going to have, where you're hit by a frost attack, and the DM's like, oh, it's weak to frost. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. Um... As far as interaction goes with elements, it's not really extra damage or less damage. The way things work in Tamers is, going back to the stats, you've got your grit or your spirit, which is how well you defend against might-based techniques or will-based techniques. So let's say you're a fire-type attacking a metal-type. Uh, fire would be good against metal. Um, and let's say you're using a might-based move. Normally, uh, the metal type would have a uh, grit, or uh, might defense, rather, of 16, mm -hmm. but since it's weak, it is 3 lower. So whenever you're attacking with a fire technique, it's effectively a 13 defense rather than 16. Yeah, and speaking of that, I did notice that the there is a dedicated domain um, set up for techniques, and something I'm cu something I am curious about is when it comes to te when it comes to techniques. Obviously, there's the die size relationship, but mm -hmm. since die size is also on um, on tamers, are there certain techniques or technique equivalents that ta that tamers can have access to? Uh, yeah. So. Uh, as I alluded to, there are going to be talent groups that will let you just straight up pick um, the special elemental techniques that the monsters can normally, you know, learn every few levels. Mm. Um, there are equivalents, though, uh, for people or for uh, tamers who don't necessarily want to go down that route. There are things called weapon actions. Uh, as they're listed in the playtest, but they've since been renamed to Weapon Arts to kind of give their name a little bit of a differentiation. I kind of ran into that issue when I was typing out a feature that said, like, yeah, you take the attack weapon action or the weapon action, and I was like, oh, wait a second. I need to change that. Um, but yeah, getting off that tangent, sorry. Um... There are weapon actions that you can expend your stamina on um, as a tamer, and uh, there's a bunch of different ones, but like Vault, for example. Uh, vault will be usually found on poles, uh, pole arms, or staves. And basically, if you choose to use this weapon action, you can swing with your staff, use the momentum, plant it in the ground, and essentially disengage from the target you're fighting and run off to wherever else you need to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and there are going to be other uh, talent features as well that will let you expand your stamina in other ways, other than just, um, you know, uh, techniques. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, in, with that in mind... From what I'm from what I'm seeing, unless I'm unless I've um, unless I'm misinterpreting something, the the cost when it comes to techniques is going to be stamina. Stamina is meant to act as a 
equivalent to MP. Uh, yeah, basically. Uh, very early on, I didn't really want to sort of split anything. Because we could have gone, like, stamina and magic and have two things, but that's just two extra things to track. Yeah, especially you're double, you're double dipping. Yeah, exactly. And especially in Tamers, kind of going into the, more of the lore of the main setting, where literally every being in this world has been touched by an element, mm -hmm. uh, you're basically drawing upon your elemental energy, which would definitely be very uh, exhausting, hence stamina, as the kind of catch-all resource. I would, if you... If... If, it, if stamina and magic being in, being different would is something that would be insisted on, I th I would have th then unless you're do unless you're doing something where they have different mechanics in their use and recovery, like say how you the demon hunter in Diablo three had two different resources that work differently, then mm. there's not really much point. Um, I'm guessing. Yeah, it's just more work for the player. I'm guessing style is the equivalent of an area of effect. Yeah, so uh, techniques are basically broken down into... Let me just pull up the thing here. Yeah, so we've got uh, style is, yeah, it's effectively the area of effect. So it's going to be either uh, contact, which is your melee attacks. Projectile is your shooting something at a single target. Infusion is more so you're looking at a target and they're being uh, infused with this energy. So it's, uh, it's something that ignores cover, effectively. Hmm. Um, emanation is something that bursts out um, from you. Burst is basically a big old fireball or water ball or, you know, an explosion effectively, at a point. Mm -hmm. Spread is sort of a burst in front of you uh, in a cone. Beam is something that travels in a line. And uh, path is like beam, but you can draw it out. So, like, you can curve it around corners if you wanted to. Given that, is this a game that you see, that you see using grid combat or using theater of the mind or a halfway point between the two? Uh, this is definitely more of a tactical, uh, RPG. So it's definitely, uh, got a big focus on grid-based combat. Alright, that's, that's certainly fair, and I'm guessing that in the full book you'll be putting in, um, some, exa some examples on that front. I'm guessing, since it's gonna be grid, it's gonna be squares and not hexes, or is it, or is hexes, like, an optional thing that one could take? Uh, I do have rules, um, I think actually in the movement section. Uh, I'm pretty sure they appeared in the playtest. Um, but yeah, there are there are rules for how to uh, deal with that. Mm -hmm. And I only point that out just because I think hexes are underrated in terms of in terms of using as a combat map. Mm, because for sure. it's significantly trickier to do to do the boxed in kicking circle also known as the goodfellas style welcome yeah uh, um on uh, slightly on the topic of hexes though uh this game also is going to be ideally played on a hex map as well it's going to have a big focus on exploration so uh, so west marches style hex crawl is completely in the cards with this game absolutely uh, while those rules are still being worked on, uh, they don't appear in the playtest. Uh, mm -hmm. But they will make an appearance once I've got them to a satisfying level. Yeah. Now, with that in with that in mind, since we've talked quite a bit about the um, ad the advancement and, and setup with um, with tamers, I'd like to shift a little bit into monsters. Obviously the core stats more or less work the same. What I'm interested in learning what changes is how advancement works. Is it mainly the upgrade setup of techniques? Do they have do they have their own um 
do they have their own ability set ability setup that is unique to them as they advance? How is it going to work? Yeah, so your monster is I've heard I've I've heard some people liken it to almost like a spell book from D and D, but not really. Um, I don't think so you're these, making people do an eight-hour rest to use techniques again, so that... No, definitely not, but it, more so in the way of kind of, like, tracking it, I suppose. Um, as your monster levels up, they'll uh, learn new techniques, but you can only have four trained at a time. Mm -hmm. So you'll have this uh, big list that you can sort of swap out if you want to on a rest. Um and, like, for different scenarios, right? If you know you're going into a cave with lots of uh, metal types, try and train up a weak move that they're going to be uh, weak to. Mm -hmm. and uh, oh, go ahead. I know, that, I know that when it came to Pokemon, the moves that you could learn were fairly, fairly, fairly linear across the levels, although you couldn't keep more than four. Are you doing a more linear approach, or are you doing something a bit broad? Um, not entirely sure what you mean by that. Oh, uh, like how, like how, how in a lot of the Pokemon games, at certain levels, they're going to learn certain moves. Um, oh but... yeah, I got you now. Okay, sorry. Um, so there is, uh, by default, yeah, they do have a set level up, uh, progression. Uh, however, kind of tying into the crafting system, uh, after you defeat monsters of certain elements, you can harvest them uh, for their essences. If you gather enough of these essences, you can make a uh, elemental condescence, uh, is what I've kind of coined them as. Basically, condensed magical energy of fire, if you've got enough fire ones, or what have you. Um... If you have enough of them, you can then uh, feed it to your monster and unlock some sort of latent potential. That potential can be either uh, one of the regular ones that they w or techniques they would have normally gotten via level up. So if you wanted to, like, say you're only level 6 and you want to grab the thing that's at level 18, you can go ahead and do that and just sort of skip that. Uh, alternatively, they can also be used to learn what are known as legacy techniques. Because uh, playing playing into the lore, back when this calamity had early uh, had started, uh, we and like elements were constantly shifting, and everything was in chaos. These monsters eventually settled on the element they are now. But in the past, let's say a fire type was actually a water type in the past. So you'll see in the legacy techniques, it can learn, it'll have some water moves. So if you feed it a water condescence, you can pick one of the uh, legacy techniques. Mm -hmm. So those are there for kind of more fun, I suppose. Like, wow, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be wacky if this thing could have a water attack, even though it's constantly spitting out fire and magma? Mm -hmm. um, also kind of like gives a bit more strategy as well. Yeah. Yeah. And obviously you're not doing the only four moves th thing that the games did. Um, yes and no. So the uh, Pokemon can only learn four moves at a time, but you do have access to any of the moves you know. You just simply have to take a rest, and you can swap them out whenever you want. All right, now the, now the spellbook analogy that some of your players have made is starting to take shape. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is I will I will level with you. I have that that whole spells per day and and spell charges appro approach that D and D has had for years. I never liked it. I tolerated mm. it at most, but I never liked it. Uh, large largely because I didn't see enough of an in universe justification for it. Mm. Fair enough. Like, I can handle, say, spell drain in Shadowrun. The idea of, yeah, this is a this is a strenuous process to use magic, so you're gonna get tired out. Mm -hmm. 
but in universe there's never been a explanation as to why you have those spell charges and why you and why you have to wait to recover them the way that you do yeah that's that's been a that's been a pet peeve of mine mm -hmm. oh yeah and having it handled by stamina i think is a pretty easy explainer for things especially since like they're an elemental creature doing a big huge fire blast as like gathering as much fire energy from within you as you can would probably cause them to uh you know be a little tired mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now with that with that said uh there's also there's also the matter of evolution to tackle. Yes. So, I did see that you have three tiers in a in a way that kind of reminded me of the evolution le levels of Digimon more than anything in Pokemon. Uh, when it comes to the t when it comes to the um, advancement on that approach, is there a re is there a reason to stick it to that one might want to stick to one stage over the other or is it a case where stages advance automatically at certain level thresholds uh so yeah stages are more of a, a linear progression mm -hmm. um, but there are three different evolution archetypes for monsters uh you've got let's see if i can remember these off the top of my head uh you've got uh metamorphic which is your third st uh, three stages uh, Mercurial, which are your two stages, and um, Conversant, which are your single stages. Each of them are balanced in their own way. Because the one very important uh, thing I did not want to follow uh, in the footsteps of what Pokemon did uh, is just have kind of stats be all over the place. And your favorite Pokemon might, like... You maybe you have like a really cool attachment to it, uh, but it's completely unusable in the game. Like I feel sorry for anybody who likes Dalcaddy, um, as an example. So there aren't going to be any weak creatures. They're all going to have the same sort of stat spread. So you're going to see all the three, uh, three stages go from base stat of 30, and then evolve base stat 40, and then evolve base stat 50. The thing with them is um, they take a while to evolve, but they are going to have the highest base stat total. And they do only have one ability they can get, whereas uh, the Mercurial, which are the two stages, they go from base stat 35 to base stat 45, but they do have two abilities they can swap between as an action mid-combat. So if you've um, got one, uh, for example, there's like a, a llama that covers itself in spit. It can change itself, uh, or change the consistency of this spit. So one of the abilities makes anything that touch, uh, poisoned, as it goes for more of a poisonous, venomous spit. Mm -hmm. And another is more of a sticky, goopy spit. So anything that hits it is slowed. You can swap between those, um, as you want to mm -hmm. uh and the final one uh is the conversant these do not evolve and they only have a base stat of 42 which early game will be nice but as the game goes on it will get a little outclassed but they do have an ability that evolves with them uh so think of uh siglacia is uh, one of our... I think the only one we've really revealed uh, outside of Sinostris. Uh It's that big snail you've probably seen in uh, all the promotional material. Uh, that one has an ability where if it gets hit by a might technique, sure, it takes the damage, but then its might increases. Um, it increases to a cap, and then as you level up, that cap increases. Uh, to kind of give an example of those sort of special evolving abilities mm -hmm. yeah because the in the early days the appeal to stick to not evolving was being able to get a being able to get um certain moves at a lower level threshold than than others mm -hmm. now 
of course, sen of course, since we're drawing upon this kind of thing, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about the act of capturing, since obviously that's a big deal. You know, weaken it first, throw the ball, hope that RN Jesus is on your side, and you use the right kind of ball to throw it to mm -hmm. try and catch the thing. What what approach are you taking when it comes to the act of capturing? Um, there, there will be a few, uh, this, this chapter is a bit more up in the air at the point, but the basics of it, uh, I have in my mind at least, uh, and a few notes written down, of course. Uh, there are going to be these things called capture shards, so very Pokemon-esque, I know. Um, but, uh, they're going to be tied into the crafting system, so as you're going upon your journey, you can find different parts to maybe make a new, more specialized one to help catch a specific monster you're looking for. Mm. Uh, they're not quite like Pokeballs in the sense that you throw it and you miss, and then, well, it's gone forever. There is a chance that if you fail to capture, it will break, but um, you will just be able to pick it up again and try again, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, that's mainly... Um, Due to the uh, the due to the um, the load system of the game, where you've usually got a bit more of like a like a ten to twenty thing, so having like a ton of these items clogging up your inventory would be kind of an issue. Uh, so there is that method. You can just simply throw this capture shard after you uh, attack a creature and hopefully capture it. Uh, they're not going to be, like, hypnotized by you, so you're going to have to take them back to your base and kind of, like, start to tame them a bit more. Um, another method, if you want to go more of, like, a cool cinematic moment set up with your DM, uh, depending on how your DM kind of wants to, to run the game, um, they can just simply go for more of just, like, a you befriend the creature kind of thing. Um, and then there are also the uh, the rot host uh, ba battles with like the specialized creatures. If you can clear them of all the parasites and heal them back up, then they're most likely going to be uh, wanting to stick around with you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and kind of going into that is something we kind of uh, skipped over. Uh, or, or, well, rather, I wanted to talk about it in the past, uh, was the bond mechanic. Mm -hmm. um, so, sort of, like, what makes monsters different from the tamers? Uh, this is uh, done in, like, a three-tiered system. Sort of. Um, so the way it is, you'll actually see it on the, uh, the character sheet. There's going to be 12 different hearts within three... Um, different circles. So this uh, bond is almost given out like inspiration from Dungeons and Dragons, but a little different in the fact that it sticks around. So to encourage players to sort of narrate what they do with their monster instead of just like never thinking about their monster at all, uh, what you do is like God. Uh, to give an example from the playtest, mm -hmm. and to kind of go over how chaotic my group is, um, one of the players who was playing Warrior from the playtest had the sheep, Somnolaria, as their companion. They were trying to impress a child in order to get uh, more information out of them, so he had the great idea of picking up the sheep and throwing it as far as possible into the ocean. Uh, I found that hilarious, and the way he narrated it was more along the lines of, like, yeah, they do this all the time. The sheep has a technique to kind of, like, mitigate damage, so it makes sense that way. Um, in that sort of situation, I'd be like, yeah, I'll give you a bond point. So from that point on, you sort of fill in the little heart, and once one of those circles is filled, so you've got four hearts, you then get a bond boon. And uh, the way these work is, going back to something I bring up a lot, <laughs> the crafting system. Mm -hmm. uh, so 
these are either going to be uh, special techniques that are going to help you in the field, like, say, a creature has got a really good sense of smell, it can help you um, hunt things down that way. Or, uh, going into uh, the, the sheep, for example. Like, you've bonded with it enough, it will let you uh, clip some of its wool off, and you can use that as a crafting ingredient in certain things. The way I've got ingredients kind of cooked up in my mind so far is they're going to have a certain amount of aspects to them. So it's not going to necessarily be like, oh man, in order to make this item, I need this one specific item from this one specific creature that does not live in any of the biomes we have, so I can't make it. Darn, that's too bad. Mm -hmm. But more, it's going to be more so like, I need something sticky, or I need something... Fibrous, uh, things like that, basically. That ma that would certainly make sense, especially since crafting systems in RPGs have a unfortunate reputation of being a bit overwrought or being a distraction from the action. Yeah, I'm I'm definitely trying to simplify things as well as having something crunchy enough for players who like that kind of thing uh, to work with. Uh, but hopefully, if all goes well, players that aren't necessarily into crafting will kind of see the benefit of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which is fair because it's always it's in a lot of games it's been something that's pushed off to the side. Not yeah. something that gets a fair amount of focus in and of itself. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure there's going to be DMs out there who go from more of a... Uh, like, make their own settings to where it's more of like a big bustling city. Uh, but the default theming and setting of this is more so like tiny villages scattered about. So you're not going to go into this one village with all your money and be like, I need all these items. And they're like, yeah, sure, we have everything. The, it's more... The points of light more, factor that was referenced in 4th edition? Um, I'm actually not too familiar with 4th fourth, fourth edition. I have nicknamed it the edition I'm supposed to hate, but I don't because I didn't get paid. But... <laughs> Early on, there was talk of a points of light philosophy when it came to the pillars of its attempt at a setting, because un unlike some editions, it actually tried to have a default setting instead of just having a, bu having a bunch of vague bullet points. But the, the big one, points of light, was this idea of villages being little lights in the darkness and adventurers go out into that into that particular darkness uh was okay the broad was the broad strokes um approach to it obviously obviously it's not the full story but mm -hmm. it's the skinny at the very least yeah that does kind of sound with uh like what i'm trying to go for which definitely makes sense mm -hmm. now with that in with that in mind, the other thing that I couldn't help but notice is that instead of doing XP, you just have a um, checklist of experiences. So I'm guessing you're playing a bit looser with um to, with advancement, not necessarily milestone, but something that is not not um a numerical XP approach either. Yeah, correct. Um, so. Think of it like, I suppose it is kind of a hybrid between traditional numerical experience and also milestones, mm -hmm. but kind of doing its own thing. Because I've, I don't know, I, I kind of see flaws with both of them, and that's kind of why I wanted to do this way. Um, so you'll notice on the sheet there are uh Five, I believe. Uh, five little hexes, and the DM will award after you um, finish a powerful fight or what have you. There's going to be um, a breakdown of like when to award how much in the book. Um, 
but uh, let's just say you do uh, a very perilous ravine crossing, for example, that might award you uh, two experiences. Mm -hmm. But, um, like, the DM will probably take notes of this, and if you want to just, like, cross the ravine again, I mean, you've done it already, so you're not going to get any more experiences out of it. Uh, if you do, um, like, I don't know, like, five sessions later, there's another ravine you need to cross, and you make it across, maybe the DM might only award you one experience, uh, or none, because you've done something like that before. Mm -hmm. And um, getting six experiences is how you'd level up. Yes, correct. Um, so it's more, a little bit more open-ended, but it is a bit more, at least for the players, trackable. And I feel like, oh man, we're at four experiences. Um, I can't wait to level up instead of the milestone approach where it's like, and you level up and the players are like, oh, uh, oh, okay, awesome, cool. Uh, sure, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm guessing that within the book you you plan on putting in some guidances regarding what would what a, what actions would be would reward a um equivalent amount of experiences, so it isn't just the isn't just the GM um having to figure it out on the fly or to reference Penny Arcade swim, damn it. Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, in pre-written adventures, we probably will be adding. Um, sort of hard and fast, like, yeah, you, if they make it across this uh, with no issues, they get three. Or if you fight this big final boss dude, you get six, and they instantly level up kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, in, in the book, it'll give examples of, like, what would one experience be worth getting? And then it would go into, like, a couple examples and, um, you know, what have you. Now, with that in with that in mind, um, what would you be shooting for as far as a total page count for the core book, at the very least? Um, across everything, so far, um, in the main rules document at the moment, it's up to seventy-five pages. Um, across all of the monsters, I. I haven't checked in a while, but I want to say it's more close to, like, 80 pages. So once everything's all said and done, I think this is probably going to be pushing, like, 250, 300, maybe more. Mm -hmm. Which definitely makes sense, especially since you'd need to have quite a bit of space just for the techniques alone. Yeah, exactly. You've got a you got the bestiary, which is very important because I want to go into detail with these creatures and kind of like give their you know bio um, biology is the word I'm looking for, um, sort of general habitat, how they kind of go about living their life, and then below that, or well, probably on another page completely, is going to be their stats, their technique learn set, and what have you. And that for all the monsters. Um, so far, I've got 33 different lines planned out. Um, as far as, like, the, the... Well, I've got a lot more planned out, but that's kind of the scope I'm aiming for with the uh, eventual base uh, Kickstarter release of this. Hmm. If it exceeds its Kickstarter goal, then we'll add more monsters. Um, and either way, we'll probably add um, other books down the line with just monsters in it to expand upon certain things. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. And Oh yeah, no problem. Hopefully Maybe. you've enjoyed my very rambly energy. Um, I've been doing this long enough that... Th that... No, but nobody is too rambly, I can assure you of that. <laughs> and of course, anytime you see fit to return, the whether it, whether it be to 
further di dive into tamers, some of the individual monsters, or just to share our in our mutual hatred of Zubats, the oh, door is always open. <laughs> like a, I've yet to find anybody who has anything nice to say about Zubats, especially some of the gens that have them all the damn time in every cave. Mm-hmm. Uh, as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Oh, boy. And well, of course, uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the Good Brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!